Hello and welcome. Today I'm joined with Mark Garretts and uh, we're doing a series of talking about issues that are happening in Parliament, uh, some things that are current, uh, that are important either to uh, the, 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 the role that I have as Parliamentary Secretary um, or to Parliament in general. And uh, very lucky today to be joined by uh, Mark Garretson, uh, who of course is MP for Kingston and the Islands, a uh, phenomenal MP, somebody who I've gotten the opportunity to get to know well over the last while as we've begun uh, working together over this term. And Mark, just a, a great pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So uh, I thought it was a good opportunity to talk. Uh, obviously, corrections is, is a big issue in Kingston. It's certainly a big issue in the domain of, uh, of public safety. Uh, and uh, often we don't think about the fact that 93% of the people who will go into uh, a prison are going to come out. And so who comes out yep. of those prisons is exceptionally important. Uh, and so the programs that we have to rehabilitate folks to make sure they're well integrated are so important. So I want to talk a little bit about the prison farm program, uh, but maybe we can talk a little bit about the issue of corrections and the state of corrections uh, generally. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I would love your reflections um, on, uh, on that issue and, uh, and, and uh, in particularly uh, given the perspective of being in from Kingston. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, the first issue for me, I think, is uh, is in the broader issue uh, of some of the issues we're facing in uh, in prison. Often, when we think of criminals, we think of them in very black and white terms: people who've committed uh, heinous acts, and obviously those people do exist, uh, and they're people for whom uh, you know obviously we uh, need to be incarcerated for incredibly long periods of time, or perhaps forever. But the vast preponderance of people in who who are in our prison systems are offering, often suffering from addictions. We know that about 80% of our prison population suffers some form of, uh, of, uh, of addiction or dependence, uh, and that most often those are mental health issues. And I've been taken by uh, going through federal penitentiaries across the country, both in my time as a critic and now as parliamentary secretary, uh, how cycles of victimization play themselves out. Uh, and that oftentimes what we're seeing is people who were victims, who had very tragic circumstances, uh, then play those out uh, in uh, in crimes, most often they're actually nonviolent in nature. A lot of the crimes yep. that we see are actually uh, folks who committed nonviolent crimes, but really stem from mental health issues and addiction issues. And I don't know if you had any reflections on that as well. Well, absolutely, and 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 that's you know one of the main things is uh, how do we help people deal with some of the challenges that they have so that they can get reintegrated uh, into society so that they can become productive members of society. And it's uh, you know it's interesting being from uh, a riding where we have so many um, uh, correctional institutions in the area. Um, as Kingstonians, we really look at corrections as um, uh, um, you know an employer in the area, um, but we also see how beneficial the programs that they have, such as the prison farm program, can be to helping people deal with the challenges that they may have. Um, and quite often, you know, it is um, things that are very uh, manageable, such as mental health, when people get the right resources, that can help them become productive members of society and, and, and be reintroduced into society again. Um, so we really, you know, value those, uh, those programs that exist. And, you know, I think as liberals, we would agree that, uh, you know, the core principle of uh, corrections is to help rehabilitate. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, through previous governments, you know, because of different philosophies on corrections, sometimes that... Uh, that uh, um, motiv the motivations are a little bit different, more perhaps of uh, lock them up and throw away the key kind of mentality. Um, but you know, I strongly believe, as I know you do, and and uh, and and most liberals for that matter, that you know, corrections should really be about helping people um, rehabilitate, and so getting those resources that they need to help deal with some of the struggles that they have. Absolutely agree, and I, I mean, I think in the debate, um, you know, our hearts always go out to victims of crime and. Uh, it's, it's so horrible when somebody uh, is on the other side of, uh, of a crime and they're victimized and the damage that that does. Um, and but at this, uh, you know, while we recognize that, honor it and try to work with victims, I think one of the things that we have to remember is that we need to stop victimization and that uh, that 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 really the, uh, the prisons that we do have are an incredible opportunity to stop those cycles of violence, to address uh, major issues and perhaps uh, to look more carefully when we have mental health is uh, issues, if 
prisons are the right solution for them. And so these right. things can coexist. And I think it's a false debate to say uh, somehow that being uh, tough on crime and caring about uh, what's happening in our prisons, caring about the people that come out are somehow disparate issues. Um, you know, and I'm sure you have stories to share. Uh, one of the ones that really touched me uh, when I was in committee of public safety uh, is an Aboriginal uh, uh, gentleman who was uh, from uh, the, uh, the Aquasasne, who was a victim of the residential schools program, who was uh, suffered uh, just really horrific abuse, um, you know, at, at the hands of a program that was a federal program, uh, and who went on to commit uh, nonviolent crimes, uh, to feed a drug habit, to because he was self-medicating. He was dealing with the pain and trauma of what he'd experienced in the residential school program, and somebody who went through our prison system, and who came out and now is a champion for Aboriginal youth and helps young people to uh, to work through their anger and their pain and their suffering in a positive way, so that they don't make the same mistakes that he did and has become a real leader and you know when I hear that kind of story to me that's what our correction system needs to be about is looking at people who uh, who've made mistakes who've fallen clearly and uh, but giving them that opportunity to uh, to heal and redeem themselves and be productive members of society yeah and and, and you're absolutely right and there are various different um, 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 resources that people that people can can use if they're available to help them with some of those struggles. You know, one of the stories that comes to mind, and you know, I, you know, as you know, and know, and and anybody who's been following corrections in the Kingston area, um, is a prison farms and farms, and that's uh, you know a program that um, you know many many years ago, and unfortunately was closed uh, um, uh, about uh, five or six years ago now. And when that happened. You know, we had a we saw a number of people come forward to speak about um, the the program. And the one gentleman in particular that came forward, and he actually had the opportunity to share his story with when the minister of public safety held, held a town hall in Kingston. But you know, he told his story, and he he said, you know, he had been in and out of prison for many years, and there had been he had mental health problems, and he had um, other challenges uh, um, with just falling into this cycle of. Of, of, of being in prison and then getting out and then being sent back and then getting out. And then finally, when he was able to um, start in, in the, the prison farm program, he, he developed um, you know, feelings and emotions that he never knew he had. And he started to connect with the livestock that he was um, you know, taking care of. And he says that that just changed who he is as a person. And as a result, when he was finally released again, you know, he had a different outlook on life and it affected the way that he interacted in society and as a result didn't continue this cycle and get back into to, to, uh, to the prison system. So it really just underscores, you know, how important it is to make sure that programs are available for people um, who are in the uh, in in prison and, and who are going through these cycles. And, you know, the farm program is not the solution for everybody. So, you know, I genuinely believe that you have to have various different resources at people's disposal. Um, if, if we're genuinely going to be making an attempt to, to help people become productive and to become contributing members of society. And, and I really think that what it comes back to is, you know, the current government of the day, their philosophy on, 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 on corrections, what it's all about. Um, you know, and, and sometimes there are people who literally need to be locked up forever. Um, but as you indicated, the vast majority, um, you know, this isn't the case. They just need to have the resources to be able to find their way. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think sometimes when we think of prisons, we uh, our minds go to the worst criminals and the worst crimes. And, uh, and certainly those exist and those are horrific and we need sentences that put those people away. But we lose sight of that huge swath, the vast majority of the population um, that are nonviolent, that are really um, uh, are people that, uh, that have issues that, that we want to see helped because they're going to be back on our streets. And no matter mm -hmm. how long the sentences are, you know, you look at California as an example and, and you know, in, in different states that adopted this, uh, you know, you lock them up and throw away the key philosophy that you're talking about. It's an abject failure. You know, it's it may mm -hmm. on, on some level, it may be emotionally appealing uh, that you have uh, this idea of locking up somebody and throwing away the key. But the, the evidence 
is overwhelming, whether or not it's Australia, the United Kingdom, the United, the United States. In fact, Newt Gingrich, who is the father of the mega prison movement himself, said um, that this was an, uh, his, the biggest failure of his political career. Uh, and and yeah. when you look at the violent recidivism rate in the United States, uh, in certain states, it can be you know up, up, up and around 20 uh, percent. Yeah. In Canada, we have a violent recidivism rate. That is a rate at which people reoffend uh, in a violent way of less than 1 percent. You know, and that's that's something I think it's important to keep in mind in this process as well. I, I just want to go back because you, you brought up the prison farm uh, program. And it's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today, because I agree with you. It isn't the total solution, but I think it's emblematic of the of, of a, maybe a different kind of thinking in corrections. And I think it really merits attention. Uh, Wayne Easter actually was the first person who brought it to my attention when I was a critic and when I first heard it, I, you know, I'll be honest, I, I thought it was kind of a little bit airy fairy, I, a prison farm. I couldn't really figure out what it was. Um, I didn't, I wasn't particularly uh, moved by it, but I had the opportunity to, to come to, uh, to Kingston and go to Frontenac and, and, and look at, uh, the facility. And I also went out East, uh, and looked at the facility there. Um, and, uh, and we also visited one in the prairies. And the stories, as you indicated, were, were so moving, both because it bred empathy working with animals. But, you know, I talked to a lot of employers in Kingston who were looking to hire people who came out of the prison farm program, because for a lot of these, um, a lot of these men who were going through the program, they had never had the structure of a normal working day. You know, they had never had that, that structure of waking up early in the morning and working through a day and the pride of getting a job done. And so they came out with this really great structure of work ethic. So there was all this criticism of, well, what are good are farming skills? But, you know, I don't know if you can speak to it, but what I heard in Kingston was that it really bred uh, essential life skills for these folks who were coming out um, and made a huge difference um, to their lives in terms of being employable on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, you know, I think one of the shortfalls of the previous government. And, you know, I'm not trying to get, you know, political here, but, you know, it, it was the previous government who made the decision um, to close the prison farms. And when they did that, you know, one of the reasons that they used was, well, nobody is graduating, so to speak, from this program and going and working on a farm. And unfortunately, what that argument did is con completely underestimate and undervalue those core skills that you're talking about and how they actually impact uh, people's lives. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I come back to this example of, of, the, of you know, one of the, the, the people that I've talked to that has gone through the program where, you know, they said, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. every day and, and, and being, having to take responsibility for livestock and, you know, executing, you know, a, a number of, of tasks that they needed to do during the day. Uh, you know, these are, you know, that developed within them the core skills that they needed. It, you know, it's like saying, it's it's like saying why would I work at a movie theater when I'm um, 13 years old? I'm never going to need to have those skills when, later on in life. Right. But what it does is it teaches you, um, you know, about responsibility and knowing that you have to be somewhere at a certain time and that you have responsibilities that you have to to live up to. And the unfortunate reality is is that a lot of people, um, even into their later adult years, still haven't developed these. Um, uh, these skills that they that they need that 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 training and this is what they're getting out of this program in particular. Um, you know, I, I can honestly say that in the 12 years that I've been in in politics in Kingston, there are few issues that the whole community, at one degree or another, either passionately or just you know mo uh, to moderately interested, really kind of get behind. And this is one of them. And I think it really took the correction, Corrections Canada by surprise because, you know, they were like, well, well why, why do people in King, like, why do Kingstonians care? These are prisoners. Like, you know, why do they care about this stuff? But, it, you know, it, it, it underscores the fact that in, in our municipality, people look at corrections perhaps a little bit differently because we're so connected to it. You know, we all know people who work in the prison or we've heard stories of different things that go on. And so, you know, we, we value those programs and why they're so important. And, you know, the prison farm one was one of the ones that the community just got behind and said, no, this isn't right. We can't be doing this. And, and to this day, six years later, after they've been closed, 
you know, every Monday night you drive in front of the uh, the Collins Bay uh, slash Frontenac Institution and you see people still picketing outside um, over the closure of this. It's, uh, you know, un- you know, it's... Uh, it's it's unfortunate what happened, but it really shows the public interest and the public's understanding of why this stuff's important. And I and I think that passion uh, comes from somewhere, right? I mean, it's it, it, mm-hmm. I think as you say, it comes from the direct experience of seeing uh, how transformative that program is and how it is able to be such a powerful tool for rehabilitation for people who, by the way, are about to be released. Um, You know, these are for individuals who are at the end of their sentence, who are going to be, uh, you know, uh, walking onto the streets. And I think that's sometimes something we forget. We think, oh, these prisoners, you know, uh, having these benefits in prison, these are people on the cusp of being let out. And we have to ask who we want to walk out those doors. And, uh, you know, in, in one of the things I, I was just out in August uh, and I had the opportunity to visit a, um, a, a, a type of prison farm kind of inspired from what happened in Kingston, uh, set up by uh, an inmate uh, who uh, was in for life. Um, and I, I don't know the nature of his crime, but he was he was there uh, and he was there with his wife and they cut up this this farm where they allow the victims to come and grow alongside uh, people who are coming in for the day from the prisons. And I had the opportunity to talk to victims and I had opportunity to talk to inmates uh, about that experience of working side by side uh, in gardens and working um, uh, to, to husband animals. And it was so powerful. I talked to one gentleman whose uh, son was very tragically murdered, who was in all kinds of pain, who said it really wasn't until he was in there and got to meet uh, some of these individuals who committed crimes uh, and see the, um, uh, for example, this gentleman who said who was who, who had uh, committed a, a, a heinous crime at some point, who said he could never make up that 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 uh, that 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 error that he made. All he can do is try to make it a little better. And if a victim comes in and wants every vegetable in that garden, it's theirs to have. To try to find some way to, in, in the smallest way, make up for for the damage that they did. And so this gentleman who was the who was who had a son who was murdered, breaking down telling me how uh, his pain had been let go, um, that you know, his healing was, uh, was, was, was so integral to that process. And, uh, and I think you know, that's, uh, those are the most hor- horrible examples, and those are things perhaps which people can't come back, but there are, um, uh, there are so many examples um, where, uh, where people have fallen in a way that is not, where, not violent and uh, where, where we can intercede before it becomes so much more tragic. And I think it's perhaps, because, and I heard so many stories, I'm sure you can relate to them in Kingston, um, where people see those stories of transformation. And I, I think that's probably what's at the genesis of becoming people becoming so passionate because who doesn't want to see that? Mm-hmm. Somebody who's, who's fallen, who's doing everything they can to try to make it up, and somebody who has suffered as a victim or have had somebody uh, in their family who suffered and finds a path to, uh, to, be, to be at peace with the horror of what's happened to them. Absolutely. And I think that you hit uh, you know, the nail on the head uh, um, when we talk about a lot of these programs, it's people, the, the people that are that are involved in them are just before that stage of being released. Um, you know, there's a misconception that somehow Paul Bernardo is going to be out there farming land uh, um, with a prison in a prison farm program. But, you know, it's it's really, you know, people who have gone through other steps in order to just about get to that part of being released. So, you know, we have a choice. Do we now release these people into society or do we have some kind of um, additional training that we can give them so that we're not going to be having to, to take them back, in, back into the prison system? And, um, you know, you, 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 know you, you talk about that. And uh, um, you know, the, example, the, the other example that you use of this farm where the, where the, the um, uh, inmates are coming together um, with victims, I mean, what better healing process if somebody's ready for that in, right. in 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 their healing what better healing process than to do that and to 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 bring them together where you know there's there's that genuine you know connection and and people can can genuinely heal with each other i mean uh, it, it's extremely moving 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, one of the things, you know, and we kind of alluded to it as we were moving through the conversation, but uh, this is a very nuanced issue. Obviously, it's an issue that, you know, I was fortunate that we have the time to be able to discuss it in all of its different facets, but it's not an issue that readies itself for rhetoric, right? Because if you if you say, well, crime is complex, the solutions to creating safe communities are complex, um, dealing with the aftermath of crime is complex, and it requires a real dialogue that, you know, it doesn't fit well into a soundbite where the opposite, which is lock them up and hang them high, uh, you know, it feeds, you know, obviously we're angry when we see a crime yep. happen and it feeds into the idea that, you know, if things were just black and white, there were bl- bad people and good people, this all would be so easy. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts when, you know, and I think about it from a public safety perspective and how we're dealing with it in a department around how do you think we engage folks in that conversation and how we overcome, pl- overcome some of the complexities of the messaging? Do you have any thoughts on that and some lessons maybe from Kingston, which is a community that I think really gets it? You know, I, I think um, that you raise a very good point, but I think that, you know, you can point to a lot within government, generally speaking, when 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 you talk about how do you address problems almost preventatively, you know, it's about, in my opinion, putting the resources in 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 advance. So you you help people um, by, you know, um, you know, how do you how do you message things? How do you communicate with people to to encourage them to you know act in a more responsible way or or not commit crime? And I think that that's what a lot of it has to do with um, is making sure that um, you know from the outset you know you're trying to 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 do things in a preventative way. We seem to want to react to things afterwards all the time, you know. Um, and yes, sometimes you know you know people might be angry because of something that has happened and they want to lash out. Um, but you know you can say this about so many different parts of government. Of government, how do you do things in a more preventative way? The same thing can be said for you know health care. You know sure. if we put a fraction in preventative health care, we're going to reap you know the benefits of not having to deal with the after effect. But I think by default, government quite often tends to be reactionary. And I think that if there is, you know, a lesson to be learned from the experience that, you know, corrections went through and the lessons that we're hearing, um, you know, those who are affected by the prison farm program in particular, the lesson is invest in me beforehand and it will save you money later on because we're not going to have to deal with the problems that are reoccurring people continue to cycle through the prison um, um, population uh, in, in particular in this example. So I think the real lesson to learn out of this is that there is a lot to be gained from preventative um, uh, measures by investing in people before you know, we're at a point of where it's being re- reactionary. Yeah, it's, it's really well articulated, Mark. I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about our national crime prevention strategy as an example, where we try to take best examples of how communities build capacity at a local level so that they can be shared across the country uh, and emulated um, so that people never go to prison in the first place. You know, I mean, when we see that yeah. first negative interaction that a young person has with the law or with their community, that interdiction at that point is so vital. Uh, you know, I was moved, I, I was moved by uh, being out in uh, some of the worst neighborhoods uh, going through um, uh, Regina and, and some terrible neighborhoods. The, the former chief of police driving me through and saying, I can point at a kid at a particular age and the crime that they've committed and I can tell you his entire rap sheet for the rest of his life because it's that predictable. And, and, yeah. and that we're waiting in too many instances for that problem to manifest in a serious crime. And then all the attention is on being reactionary to that crime and what is the sentence for that crime when there were so many opportunities five, 10, 15 years earlier in that person's story where an intervention yeah. would have stopped any of those crimes from happening and would have allowed that person to become a productive member of society. <laughs> Absolutely. And leave the whole social part of it aside and just look at it from the economic part. I mean, it costs so much less to invest earlier on than to be reactionary. So, I mean, even if, you know, um, you're of a more, you know, right wing kind of approach to this, just look at the economics of it. You know, it, it, it costs less to invest earlier on as opposed to trying to be reactionary later on. 
Um, you know, and then of course there's the social benefit of it too. Um, and you know, I think if if we you know really look to other countries that have been successful in keeping crime rates low, um, you know, I'm sure you'll find that there's a lot more investing um, in the in in the upfront um, um, as opposed to countries that have gone kind of another route and privatized prisons and and uh, and stuff like that. I just I, you know, I think that there is a lot to be said about investing in the upfront uh, when it comes to this. But, you know, as you and I would both know, that's uh, politically challenging. It's always hard to put money into something that comes off as abstract because it's extremely difficult later on to quantify what the results of it are. It's hard to say, well, we invested all this money um, and, you know, we have to wait a long time before we actually see the return on it. And, uh, you know, that takes uh, political will. And, uh, and, and with the various challenges that, that we face politically, it's extremely difficult to do that from time to time. It is because, as you say, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, we just wake up in a safer community. Uh, there's no ribbon to cut. There's no uh, the government that probably did it is long gone and everybody's forgotten them. And so it is it's a, it's, it's a particular political challenge. But I think your your point is a really salient one around looking at other jurisdictions, uh, you know, looking at the hard evidence and really taking the emotionality out of this question and saying, look, we all want safer communities. It doesn't matter if you're on the left or you're right or what political party you're with. We want less victims. We want less crime. We want safer communities. You know, we want to the best of our ability to put prisons out of business so that because there aren't yep. crimes being committed. And there are some great examples globally of programs that are successful. And by the way, the prison farm program is one of them. And, uh, and it requires, uh, you're right, it requires political will in a more complicated debate. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I, I'm so appreciative of you engaging in this discussion today, Mark. Yeah. Uh, absolutely my pleasure. It's uh, It's been a great discussion. Great, and one that uh, we hope to continue uh, on this and other issues. Uh, certainly uh, the issues around crime uh, have many different angles than uh, than just dealing with prisons, but I thought this was a, a good uh, place to start uh, because there's been a lot of discussion lately about it and because uh, the Prison Farm Program is back in the news uh, with uh, with an advisory committee that's, uh, that's uh, advising the government on how to move forward to returning the Prison Farm Program, which I think is an excellent step. Uh, Mark Gerritsen from Kingston and the Islands, thanks so much for, uh, for taking this time uh, to talk today. Thanks a lot for having me, Mark. You bet. And thank you.